So, uh, okay. Um, thank you very much for introducing me. Uh, and uh, I'm really delighted that I participate in this special conference. And I really thank you, I mean, uh, Dr. Um, Song for inviting me to this special event. It's really a great honor. And in my presentation today, I'd like to share uh, some of my research on multiculturalism and education, especially with respect to the actual impact of immigrant integration policies on immigrant children's educational performance, actually. So I will show you some, some evidence, some very interesting evidence that not all policies work the same, but there's some, you know, some special type of policies that work better for immigrant students' educational performance. So stay tuned, you will find, all right? Um, okay. Let me start with this table. Uh, this table shows the number of international migrants uh, on the globe. And you see that there is a clear increasing pattern over the past several decades. And it was um, the proportion of international migrants as a percentage of the total population was about 2.3% in 1970. But uh, it's now uh, more than 3.6% uh, today. That means if we randomly select uh, a group of 30 people from around the world, uh, there is a high chance that at least one person is an international migrant, right? Um, so there's a clear pattern, I mean, increasing pattern, you see. And this is an interesting map, uh, world map, and you see that there are some popular destinations for uh, immigrant migrants. So uh, international migrants, and, and those countries include, for example, Canada, Sweden, Qatar, you know, Singapore, Australia, those kind of countries are some of the popular destinations for immigrant, uh, you know, no, um, international migrants. And in addition to those popular destinations, uh, there are some um, newly emerging uh, destinations. Uh, you know, uh, if you see this map, there are some dark blue countries and um, Korea is actually one of them. And, and those dark, dark blue countries are the places where the, the increasing pattern is really clear. So when it comes to Korea, if you look at the previous map, the Korea is almost white in color, which means that uh, in Korea, the absolute proportion of international migrants is not very high, actually. In, in Korea, the number is not, you know, you know, we say that Korea is really a multicultural society, but in reality, Korea is really a homogeneous country and the proportion of international migrants uh, are very low compared to other countries. But, uh, in this map, Korea is really, really dark blue, which means that the rate of change is really fast. I mean, the increasing pattern is one of the most, I mean, uh, compared to other countries. So um, there are many such countries, you know, uh, many such countries where the, the increasing pattern is really fast. So um, those kind of increasing pattern uh, means that there are also uh, an increasing number of uh, international students, I mean, students with uh, diverse cultural and linguistic backgrounds around the world. So um, it's really important to uh, ensure that immigrant youth are well integrated into an educational system. It's really an important policy you know, goal now because educational pathways of these children will determine not only their own individual futures, but also the future of society as a healthy, you know, integrated whole. So it's really an important uh, policy topic. You know, um, it's really, you know, uh, this is, um, you know, uh, a, a column, uh, by, you know, published in Donga Ilbo, uh, Donga Daily Newspaper. And uh, Professor Song also stresses that there is an urgent need to revise the Elementary and Secondary Education Act to reflect the changes in the multicultural environment. So this is really, an important policy topic around the world, including Korea. And uh, an OECD report also notes that uh, in most countries, immigrant students lag behind native students in performance. In many countries, the difference is considerable. So this is the key, key you know, uh, policy concern. Uh, you know, uh, there is a, there's a gap. There's a clear gap between um, immigrant background children and non-immigrant background, non-immigrant children in terms of their 
academic performance. So this is one of the key topic in policy. Uh, so, uh, and, and even after accounting for socioeconomic status, immigrant children's performance uh, often still lags behind in many countries uh, as uh, reported by a uh, child's study, for example. Um, I think that uh, immigrant children's educational disadvantages emanate from the uneven social distribution of opportunities among different social cultural groups in society. And um, such educational dis uh, disadvantages are also not just individual issues, but also a social challenge that constrains the political, you know, the potential of society to maximize its human and social capital. So this is a question, important question. Does you know policy work uh, to you know to narrow the gap between you know uh, immigrant background children and their non-immigrant peers in terms of their uh, academic performance? Does policy work? This is a an important question, uh, and um, actually we don't know. This is an important question, but actually we don't know. Does policy work? Not much study, not much research has been done in this respect because you know we kind of believe that those kind of policies works. I mean, we kind of believe because we, there is a kind of a um, discursive legitimacy attached to uh, the notion of multiculturalism. We rarely question the importance of multiculturalism and many multiculturalist policies are you know, supported ideologically and discursively you know, based on, for example, human rights discourses. So we, you know, in many countries, uh, they uh, institutionalize uh, educational policies uh, that actually incorporate some versions of multiculturalism, but, you know, are they, um, uh, you know, scant effort that actually has been devoted to, you know, evaluating those policies, whether in terms of whether they really, really work. Um, so I think um, it's important to look at with the actual impact of those policies. And um, immigrant integration policies may serve as an important explanatory variable for the systemic inclusion and exclusion of immigrants. And disparities in the social distribution of opportunities vary across countries depending on uh, public policies according to uh, many studies. So I hypothesized that different integration policies because, you know, different countries have different versions of integration policies. So uh, different uh, policies may work, either alleviate or exacerbate educational dis uh, disparities. Uh, that's basically my uh, you know, uh, assumption or hypo hypothesis. So uh, I examined if and how the cross-national variation in educational disadvantages for immigrant children is associated with the variation in integration policies. So, so uh, basically I look at the correlation between, you know, educational dis uh, disparities on the one side and differences in policies on the other side. Um, the conceptual framework uh, of the study is based on the bi-dimensional model of immigrant citizenship rights uh, which was elaborated by Kupmans and his colleagues. Uh, in this model, citizenship you know, rights for immigrants included two distinct dimensions. The first one is immigrants equal access to civic rights. And the other is public recognition of group differentiated rights for ethno, uh, ethnocultural minorities. So we have two uh, dimensions. Uh, and this is the uh, illustration of the dimension, I mean, the model. And you see uh, uh, the, the horizontal line represents the uh, equal civic rights and the vertical line represents a group-based cultural right. And in this model, you see uh, some kind of uh, ideal type, you know, regimes of immigrant integration, including, you know, universalism, multiculturalism, assimilationism, and segregationism, right? And, um, the civic right, equal civic rights dimension, uh, actually this dimension differentiates countries in terms of the extent to which 
individual equality is granted to immigrants in terms of formal rights and duties. Um, so the dimension, this dimension is closely linked with the societal stance on legal citizenship rights for immigrants. Um, uh, it refers to the degree to which a country's integration policies are based on a civic territorial understanding of citizenship as opposed to an ethnocentric understanding. Immigrants have the similar rights and duties as non-immigrants in the cluster of countries in which legal civic rights are distributed inclusively rather than restrictively. The countries that score high on this dimension tend to provide easy access to nationality and offer similar rights uh, to citizens and aliens. And uh, horizontal, uh, no, no, uh, uh, vertical, you know, uh, dimension, uh, this dimension, group-based cultural rights, this dimension uh, differentiates countries in terms of the extent to which um, individuals can maintain their collective identities and practices brought from their countries of origin. And uh, this dimension captures the extent to which uh, countries' integration policies undergird a culturally pluralist understanding of citizenship as opposed to a monocultural understanding. Um, immigrant minorities enjoy a high level of public recognition and support on the basis of their ethno-cultural uh, group memberships if the countries in which they settle are characterized by a greater degree of tolerance toward or celebration of cultural pluralism. Uh, and uh, the countries that score high on this dimension make few cultural assimilation demands for access to rights and facilitate separate institutional arrangements for minorities. And um, these are some of the, you know, I actually, uh, the Rudin, Rudin is the person who, uh, you know, uh, constructed a cross-country uh, cross uh, index, I mean, some kind of scores. Uh, based on uh, Kupuman's two-dimensional model. And these are some of the, some of the countries. I mean, uh, I didn't uh, put all the countries here. I just randomly select some countries. And, um, you know, uh, Canada is a typical multiculturalist uh, society and Japan is typical assimilationist society. And there are many different countries. And uh, you see, do you know where is, you know, do, can you guess where is, you know, Hungary on this dimension? I mean, this model. According to root, I mean, according to Rudy's, right, exactly, <laughs> correct, right, somewhere around Greece, you know, uh, hunger is uh, just, you know, uh, right here, uh, right here. That means uh, hunger is a country that is between assimilationism and universalism, for example, uh, exactly. And and uh, when it comes to Korea, Korea is around here, and United States around here, right. So um, multiculturalism, uh, here's an important question, multiculturalism, does it work as a policy? So uh, there has been debate. I mean, there have been many different kinds of debates whether multiculturalism really, really work. I mean, people, it, it's a normative discourse, right? Multiculturalism, normatively, we, everybody, you know, even if we don't agree with the notion of multiculturalism, you know, people usually agree that multiculturalism is important because it's a normative ideology, right? So multiculturalism, does it work? I mean, from a, you know, a policy point of view, policy uh, evaluation perspective, many proponents of multiculturalist integration policies make claims about the normative legitimacy of multiculturalism open based on the international human rights discourses. You know, it's really important. It's human rights, right? Uh, and some other uh, proponents uh, take a pragmatic stance by arguing that countries would benefit from cultural diversity uh, as a potentially useful asset in an increasingly globalized economy. Cultural diversity is important, right? Uh, you know, multicultural competence is important for everybody in our country because, you know, economy is becoming globalized more and more. And as a competent citizen, we have to, you know, uh, prepare our citizens to be competent as a multicultural citizen, uh, right? So those kind of uh, uh, proponents argue uh, these things. But there are some other people too, uh, many opponents of multiculturalist under, uh, integration policies are concerned 
that multiculturalism would result in divisive effect on social cohesion. People, you know, there are people, researchers, serious researchers uh, are concerned about uh, this kind of uh, things. Uh, they, uh, you know, uh, provide some evidence that multiculturalism, uh, you know, may uh, um, contribute to thickening the lines between ethnocultural groups. Um, so um, I think that uh, the right question is this, not, you know, the, the question should be a little bit uh, more elaborate, uh, whether, you know, the previous question was usually whether multiculturalism works or not. But my question is, what kind of policies really work? This is my question. And I suspect that countries with a greater degree of equal civic rights combined with a moderate degree of group-based cultural rights offer an optimal context for immigrant children to minimize their educational disadvantage. And I call these countries balanced multiculturalism countries. And those countries are characterized by a certain level of multiculturalism sustained without universalism being abandoned. So uh, in this model, again, I uh, suspect that countries on the right side provide a better environment for uh, immigrant uh, children's educational success uh, than the countries on the other side. And uh, also, I believe that, uh, you know, I, I, I hypothesize that countries, you know, when it comes to the group-based cultural rights dimension, countries in the middle uh, provide a better environment for, you know, uh, uh, immigrant background children's educational performance than other countries that are either very high or very low on this dimension. So if we put those two different layers together, there's an overlapping area. And this is the area uh, that I call uh, balanced multiculturalism. So uh, let me tell you more. This is, I have two different hypotheses and this is the first hypothesis. Uh, the hypothesis is uh, the inclusionary civic rights hypothesis. And uh, this is the hypothesis. The academic performance of immigrant children is more compatible to that of non-immigrant children in countries in which civic rights are distributed more inclusively. Uh, so, right, uh, again, the countries in this, you know, side, on this side. So uh, actually there have been some studies that kind of uh, suggested that this, uh, you know, hypothesis uh, is uh, valid. So for example, on OECD report, uh, shows that educational performance gaps tend to be most pronounced in European countries with a history of post-war foreign labor recruitment, such as Austria, Germany, and Switzerland, where exclusionary integration policies have been common and naturalization laws have been restrictive. And um, some other uh, studies, for example, Drunkers and, uh, and Fleischmann, uh, uh, their study uh, shows that um, inclusionary naturalization laws of host countries are positively related to immigrant educational uh, attainment. And let's move on to the second hypothesis. Uh, uh, this is what I call the moderate cultural rights hypothesis. The academic performance of immigrant children is more comparable to that of uh, non-immigrant children in countries that have developed a greater balance between cultural diversity and unity. Uh, so, you know, again, uh, this was uh, the, uh, the model I showed you right before. And um, so uh, multiculturalists often contend that immigrants benefit from the government's recognition and legitimization of the rights for diverse groups to maintain their ethnocultural group identities. However, actually, when it comes to actual research, Mixed research have been reported uh, as to whether such multicultural empowerment of minority groups is truly beneficial to their educational success, at least in terms of, you know, measured performance. Uh, for example, uh, there are contrasting uh, findings uh, when it comes to title study, for example, uh, they uh, analyze the team's data and they show that the degree of individual countries incorporation of multiculturalism to educational policies 
is positively associated with ethno-linguistic minority children's academic success. So multiculturalism works. May, it looks like multiculturalism works for you know, minority students. But when it comes to Shiren's and Vander, uh, Vander Werf's uh, study, uh, despite the overall weakening of multiculturalism policies, in the case of Netherlands, in recent decades, signs of narrowing gaps in educational performance are observed. So this is quite contrary to the, the multiculturalist argument, right? So there are mixed results uh, when it comes to the empirical uh, findings. So countries are often actually faced with the dilemmas of diversity uh, that emanate from the tensions uh, between the diversity and unity agendas. There are two different agendas. One is diversity and the unity. They're both important actually, but there are tensions in reality. In theory, they may you know, harmonize, but in reality, they are more tensions, right? Uh, on the one hand, the diversity agenda urges the government to construct a more inclusive form of citizenship uh, by allowing minority groups to maintain their distinctive cultures and identities, which is important. But on the other hand, the unity agenda sheds light on the government's role in promoting a common sense of national identity, which is equally important too. So James Banks also noted that, you know, uh, it is difficult challenge for government to provide opportunities for various groups to maintain aspects of their community cultures while building a nation in which these groups are structurally included and to which they feel alliance, right? And Soroka et al.'s study notes the importance of uh, reconciling these two different policy agendas, right? Unity, diversity. And Banks similarly stresses that diversity and unity should coexist uh, in a delicate balance in uh, a democratic multicultural uh, nation state. This is from the introduction to multicultural education, you know, the, the textbook, you know, which was translated by Professor Mo, I mean, into Korean, right? So th this is from that book. And um, so I, I suspect that immigrant children would benefit pro, uh, more in countries with a moderate level of a multicultural pluralism, a moderate level uh, into uh, integration policies than in countries characterized strongly uh, by either cultural pluralism or monism. So in reality, uh, you know, uh, an overemphasis on pluralism is liable to result in societal fractionalization and group-based segregation. And uh, an overemphasis on monism may entail practices of cultural domination and subordination. So uh, I expect uh, immigrant children's educational disadvantages to be alleviated by the kind of policies that help, uh, help immigrants not only to maintain their cultural funds of knowledge, but also to acquire the dominant cultural capital of the mainstream society, uh, rather than by the policies that heavily endorse one at the expense of the other. So the balance is important. So this is the research design uh, of my study. And um, I, um, you know, uh, basically, um, all right. Uh, there's a basically a negative, you know, um, association between uh, immigrant background of individual students and their performance and uh, you know um, and the data you know came from PISA uh, and um, uh, the data you know uh, let me explain a little bit a little bit more uh, because you know uh, there is a negative interaction uh, you know uh, association between these two you know that means immigrant background the students have a lower level of, you know, they ex exhibit a lower level of educational performance compared to non-immigrant background students, right? And that association, uh, you know, uh, is either alleviated or ex exacerbated by, you know, different policies. And I expect that there is a positive interaction between immigrant background and equal civic rights. Uh, which is consistent with hypothesis one. And when it comes to the second one, group-based cultural rights, I expect a quadru you know, negative quadratic interaction effect between immigrant background you know, variable and the group-based cultural rights. And these two policy index, uh, indices came from Rudin's index based on Kupferman's framework. 
Uh, so I analyzed uh, more than 200,000 children uh, in 34 countries. And this is the descriptive statistics table. Um, and these are some of the main um, independent variables. So uh, there are dummy coded uh, immigrant backgrounds variables, uh, first generation and second generation. And uh, there are at the country level, there are two different policy variables, equal civic rights and cultural rights. Th these are country level you know uh, policy variables and this is the, the actually the model it looks complicated but it's pretty simple actually uh, if you see that here uh, the performance this is an individual student's educational performance scores and this score uh, this variable is modeled as a function of immigrant backgrounds whether they have immigrant backgrounds or not and um, and the these are the, the effects, right? But beta one and beta two, those effects are again modeled as at level two, modeled as a function of, you know, uh, policy variables. Um, and this is actually the hierarchical linear modeling uh, analysis results. And I will go really quick and um, I will just skip those, uh, you know, results. And this is the actually the, you know, visualization of the results. And you see that uh, as this is, uh, this uh, graph shows uh, the performance gaps according to varying levels of equal civic rights. So here's equal civic rights. And these, this, this is the, you know, the performance gaps, right? So uh, there's a negative correlation. You see that when uh, equal civic rights increases in terms of the policy, the gap, performance gap between immigrant background students and their non-immigrant uh, peers decreases. So that means uh, inclusionary civic rights may be important as a policy, you know, uh, strategy, right? This is really a straightforward, you know, pattern here. And, um, and here's another, you know, pattern. This pattern looks a little bit different from the previous uh, pattern. And the... Uh, you see that this is the relationship between group-based cultural rights and uh, performance gap. And you see a U-shape, pretty interesting, right? A U-shape, which means that as group-based cultural rights, I mean, in terms of the policy institutionalization, when the degree increases, you know, uh, the gap somehow decreases. It looks decreases, but at a certain point, it again increases, right? for both first generation immigrants and second generation immigrants and every, you know, when it comes to all the subject areas, math, reading and science, right? Pretty interesting, right? So that's why I argued that some kind of, multi, you know, moderate level of, you know, uh, multiculturalism would be, you know, some, something we have to seriously consider as important, right? Um, so uh, I basically, you know, as I just mentioned, uh, the, the pattern you just, you know, uh, saw was based on the PISA data set. And I actually analyzed another data set to see whether the patterns were replicated. So I uh, analyzed TIMS data again, which is another large scale international, you know, a student assessment data set. And the patterns were, you know, quite identical to the previous findings, right? Um, so this is the key, these are the key findings. The academic performance of immigrant children is more comparable to that of non-immigrant children in certain countries that are characterized by a more egalitarian distribution of civic rights. The civic rights important, you know, the legal civic rights, that's important. And um, the educational dispar uh, disparity for immigrant students is smallest in countries characterized by the balanced social political emphasis on diversity and unity. So in closing, uh, I'd like to emphasize that immigrant minorities successful and healthy acculturation may largely be a function of the degree to which the dominant society is culturally inclusive and structurally non-discriminatory. Policy efforts toward achieving a balanced level of diversity combined with systemic levers for egalitarian civic rights appear to be conducive to a macro level institutional environment in which the social disadvantages of immigrant children may be attenuated. So thank you very much.